chapter eight of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter eight elton manor love she said is just a game that does for summer weather love he answered is a flame putting lesser lights to shame making wealth and rank and fame weigh lighter than a feather sure she cried we mean the same love is but a fancy name for you and me together when paul seaton and dick Estelle were respectively twenty-six and thirteen the former was offered the post of editor to the new magazine the pendulum and the latter was considered fit to enter eton so paul concluded his pleasant life at esdale court and went to live in london to prepare himself the more fully for that great book he meant to write some day by that time his friendship with miss carnaby was an established factor in his existence paul called it friendship because he was as yet too poor to call it by any other name but the other name was ready as soon as paul had secured a sufficient status and income to allow him to rechristen the sentiment he was very glad to take up his abode in london but there again london was only a euphemism for isabel living in london meant seeing isabel frequently therefore london was the most desirable place of residence under the sun lady farley was always at home on thursday afternoons and consequently thursday became paul's sabbath he called as often as he dared and when he felt it but decent to allow a thursday to elapse without his dropping in at prince's gate he sympathized with the irish peasant who said his reverence is going to dublin fair so there will be no sunday this week and isabel also measured time by thursday afternoons and felt such seasons a blank indeed if they did not bring paul she waited till he arrived before she ordered up the second brew of tea and she took care to pour his cup out first she talked to him for as much time as she could spare from other visitors and listened to him all the time that she was conversing with them and he was talking to somebody else she introduced him only to clever men and to plain women and in short she generally behaved herself as all right-minded and right-mannered young women do under similar circumstances she derived almost as much happiness as paul did from their friendship but she pretended that she did not know that friendship was only a nom de plume all the same she could have found the right name in the dictionary with her eyes shut tickets of admission into eden are variously worded and paul seaton received one after he had been for a year or so editor of the pendulum couched in the following terms dear mr seaton sir benjamin isabel and i leave town on the tenth and we shall be so pleased to see you if you will run down to farley castle on the following saturday and spend the sunday with us yours very truly caroline farley when paul arrived at farley castle on that blissful and broiling saturday afternoon he found a distinguished company drinking tea upon the lawn the estales were there with violet and there was a peer and a cabinet minister also lord robert thistletown a younger son of the marquis of wallingford likewise miss ethel gordon a celebrated beauty and one or two others that merely served as padding lady farley duly presented paul to her other guests and he sat down to be refreshed in and by their company that is a capital article of yours on art and education in the current number of the pendulum seaton remarked sir benjamin after a due discussion of the heat of the weather and the lateness of saturday trains 
it is very kind of you to say so replied paul but i felt it was far too large a subject to be treated in so small a space and my limits handicapped me a good deal i also read it with much interest said lord wrexham though i fear i did not agree with it all it appears to me that we require education to make us understand art rather than that art is in itself an education paul shook his head of course education helps us with technique but i think that art itself is independent of education the artist like the poet is born not made then do you mean to say asked lord wrexham that the artist of to-day is none the better for the art produced in the centuries that lie behind him he is a richer man replied paul but not i think a better artist there is no heritage in art as there is in science the artist is complete in himself without ancestors or successors like melchizedek suggested sir benjamin exactly said paul but the man of science on the contrary builds on foundations which his predecessors have laid and reaps what they have sown i think you are about right remarked mr kesterton the cabinet minister an ordinary plumber now knows more than galileo did and a chemist's assistant more than jenner but our innumerable host of minor poets have not yet out shakespeared shakespeare nor do our modern impressionists put raphael and michelangelo to shame still some of the modern pictures are very pretty don't you think chimed in lady esdale and so much more interesting than the old ones do you know i get rather tired of nothing but madonnas and holy families of course they are very nice in their way and devout and religious and all that but if i had to choose a picture i'd much rather have a hunting scene or a railway station or a scotch moor mr kesterton did not answer some men he felt were appointed to govern kingdoms and some to talk to silly women but no man could reasonably be expected to do both my lady's tastes are modern said sir richard smiling yes they are agreed sir richard's wife i'd rather read a new novel than all shakespeare's things put together and i enjoy gilbert and sullivan far more than handel and mozart so do i lady esdale chimed in lord robert thistletown i am the heir of all the ages in the foremost files of time and i cannot waste my time in looking back like lot's wife but if as you say the artist is born not made how can art be an education inquired lord wrexham art is really the interpretation of nature replied paul therefore the artist has the power to reveal to others what he alone has the eyes to discover for himself he will not teach other men to be artists he will only show them what he has seen do i make myself clear lord wrexham i know what i mean but i am afraid i put it rather badly not at all i quite grasp your meaning said his lordship graciously though i am not yet sure that i concur with it if art is an integral part of a good education as mr seaton asserts remarked mr kesterton we shall have to spend more money on public picture galleries and how the exchequer of the future will stand it goodness only knows i am thankful to think that by that time i shall be where budgets cease from troubling i am going to write an article for the pendulum on love as education a sort of opposition shop to mr seaton's school of art said isabel carnaby there is really nothing so admirable from an educational point of view as the process known as falling in love and i consider that a government that makes education compulsory ought to insist upon every one's falling in love at least once before he or she is five-and-twenty 
i should call it passing the seventh standard seven being the perfect number you know a capital idea my dear young lady said mr kesterton graciously for isabel always amused him should you erect special schools for the purpose may i ask yes gorgeous red and white palaces like the board schools and they would be called highest grade schools and i should superintend them myself and no one better qualified is it impertinent to ask if you would combine the office of object with that of instructress not necessarily of course it is better for men to fall in love with me than with any one else teaches them more i mean and bores them less but i shouldn't make it a sine qua non i should advise it but not insist upon it if they preferred to do so the pupils might fall in love with somebody else but it would be like learning literary style from the polite letter-writer instead of from the classics i should undertake the girl's department cried lord robert it is more than a liberal education to a woman to fall in love with me it includes all the extras and a year's finishing abroad into the bargain isabel shook her head i'm not so sure about that it is so when a girl falls in love with me she realizes at once that brains and beauty and wealth are mere worthless and vulgar attributes but that a heart of gold beating under a pocket of very small silver is the only thing really worthy of a woman's regard this has a most elevating and refining effect on their dear little characters bless em it has indeed therefore i shall put aside my constitutional shyness and undertake the girl's department of the highest grade school you have no constitutional shyness to put aside lord bobby said lady farley so your sacrifice to the common weal is not so stupendous after all how you misjudge me sighed lord robert it is ever my fate to be misjudged by my dearest and best shyness is my bane my besetment and it is only my exquisite unselfishness which enables me to overcome it as i do in order to make other people happy by the uninterrupted flow of my improving conversation and this is all the thanks i get i suppose everybody feels shy sometimes said miss carnaby not everybody argued lord robert take my word for it you never do yes i do under certain circumstances when do tell us besought violet esdale isabel thought for a moment i am shy of people who make me feel things she replied slowly do you mean you feel shy of a man if you think he is going to make you an offer or to pull one of your teeth out inquired lord robert with friendly interest roughly speaking yes that's a pity because in either case it is sport to them you see so it is unfortunate if it is death to you isabel smiled my dear lord bobby how absurd you are now perhaps you will respond to my confidence and tell us when you feel shy bobby thought for a moment when my boots creak he answered everybody laughed it is no laughing matter i can assure you he continued i've got a pair now that make me feel as timid as an unfledged schoolgirl every time i put them on i wore them to go to church only last sunday and they sang such a processional hymn to themselves all the way up the aisle that by the time i reached our pew i was half dead with shame and the beauty born of murmuring sound had passed into my face but it wasn't the type of beauty that was becoming to me it was too anxious and careworn for my retrousse style weren't your people awfully ashamed of you asked isabel there were none of them there except my mother and she sat at the far end of the pew and tried to look as if i were only a collateral i wonder if your mother ever feels shy remarked violet dreadfully of her own maid 
she has had her for a long time and i believe that when a maid has had a right of way across your head for over seven years she can do your hair in what style she likes and you may not interfere that i am told is the law with regard to rights of way do you ever feel shy inquired isabel of mr kesterton only when i am introduced to babies and their mothers look as if they expected me to kiss them to kiss the babies i mean not the mothers that would not make me feel nearly so shy i am always being godfather to the terrible little things and giving them spoons but i confine myself to the silver variety are you many godfathers this is what i am miss carnaby i am one husband three fathers nine grandfathers and seventeen godfathers thirty gentlemen in one so ten times better than cerberus and what it costs me in presents is something fabulous isabel turned to lord wrexham when are you shy always i invariably feel that i am boring people and this makes me bore them all the more and you uncle benjamin when i go out shooting my dear i am a bad shot at best and knowing this i am consequently generally at my worst my governor is a first-rate shot announced lord robert proudly i know no young man who is equal to him but i am a poor hand at the job myself nowadays fathers shoot better than their sons as a rule i think a proof of the decadence of the race that's a good sentence i shall wait till you have all forgotten it and then make use of it again does your father shoot much he inquired turning to paul paul smiled my father is a methodist minister he said so he knows nothing about sport dear me how queer exclaimed ethel gordon looking at paul with as much curiosity as if he had said his father was a giraffe but lord robert came to the rescue i've got an uncle in that line of business he remarked airily at least he is a bishop and he is the best old chap i ever met in my life a regular saint don't you know i dare say your governor is the same he is a good man answered paul simply so is my uncle ambrose and there is nothing like it after all it takes time you bet to be as good as that but it pays in the long run i wish you knew my uncle you'd like him he gives away everything he has to charity and he really cares for nothing in the world but how to make other folks better and happier he is the bishop of dichester i know lord ambrose thistletown by name of course well said paul it is a beastly sea continued bobby all smoke and manufactures and working men and things of that kind they have offered him better ones but he will stay on there because he thinks he can do more good among poor people than among rich ones and i guess he is about right that is very noble of him oh he is like that all through a regular good sort out and out but his wife is simply awful she is always worrying him to go to a place where there would be a bigger palace and more swagger friends for her and she is for ever preaching to the poor old man about the claims of birth and the duties of rank and rot of that sort poor lord ambrose said isabel sympathetically she is simply sickening continued bobby when she gets on her high horse and rates the bishop for not properly fulfilling the duties of his position and the claims of his station she feels those claims so strongly herself she says that she should consider it a sin to disregard them she was the daughter of an archdeacon you know and bobby chuckled to himself she can't bear me said lady esdale she thinks i am worldly because i wear a fringe and dance round dances and so she gives me a cheap and religious little book every time she meets me lord bobby clapped his hands with delight i know them he cried the mammon worshippers and outlandish women are two of her choicest gifts in store but she has plenty of others for those who need them what irritates me in the woman is that she is such a toady she dismisses her servants without characters if she finds they are not strict teetotalers and yet once when that horrid 
lord watertight was regularly drunk at a party she said it was his animal spirits only that carried him away and that he was a most lovable young man spirits carried him away i confess but they were vegetable and not animal ones that was just like her said lady Estale. she not only believes that the king can do no wrong but that the peerage can do no wrong either which is carrying a good principle to an untenable extreme continued lord bobby but did you ever hear the poem that lady eleanor gregory wrote about her no was it very smart asked lady farley eleanor's verses generally are awfully good i wish i could repeat it to you but i can only remember one verse this is it a bishop must not revel in strong drink though he may take a little i have heard just for the sake of no i do not think it maidenly to use the pauline word i only say he'll take some should there cease to be beneath his apron perfect peace everybody was amused and mr kesterton shouted with laughter capital he cried capital lady eleanor is a clever little girl but it is a pity she does not confine herself to penning humorous verses instead of indulging in the love-sick ditties we frequently read in the magazines above her signature still she can write good poetry remarked paul that may be but i don't like young ladies to wear the willow in print in that fashion i may be old-fashioned but that is my opinion and mine too agreed lord wrexham i expect her willow is an artificial flower said isabel or she would not wave it before the public eye the people who have really felt things don't write about them then don't you think the faithless swain of her poems is a real person wondered ethel gordon i once asked her if he was answered lord robert everybody was asking the question behind her back i told her and i thought it a more effective plan to ask it before her face and what did she say was she angry with you inquired miss gordon not she she merely laughed and said she had drawn a bow at a venture and it was therefore only a fancy portrait very smart again murmured mr kesterton approvingly girls who can make jokes like that ought not to waste their time reeling out poetry as easily as if they were ravelling an old stocking they should leave that to the dull sentimental women who wear their hearts in their sleeves and their curls down their backs was lady ambrose very furious at the poem asked lady Estale. it was just the sort of thing to make her mad if any one but a ladyship had written it i don't think she ever saw it replied bobby but the bishop did and enjoyed it immensely he loves a joke does the dear old bishop and loves it all the more if his wife is out of it i remember that she was described therein as a godly venus rising from the sea and my father has called lady a the godly venus ever since mr kesterton chuckled appreciatively what i can't stand is humbug continued lord robert and when i see that woman ready to sell what she is pleased to call her soul for money and position and all that and then hear her jawing against mammon and worldliness and things of that sort it makes me feel positively sick paul smiled and could not help thinking of mrs martin he remembered a tale he had once heard of some staffordshire colliers who went to see the sights of london and their surprise reached its height when one exclaimed i say bill they've got the same old moon here as we've got at tipton the sights of london are still very wonderful and well worth seeing but they've got the same old human nature there as they've got at tipton and everywhere else under the sun that weekend was a season of perfect bliss to paul partly because he was in the company of some of the best-mannered and most brilliant people in england but principally because isabel carnaby was nice to him he carried her prayer-book to church for her on sunday morning and the scent of russia leather sent a thrill through him all his life afterwards while the sound of her voice in the hymns made those particular psalms stand out from the rest of hymns ancient and modern for ever in paul seaton's ears on their way back from church isabel asked him if he had begun to write his book not yet answered he you know you told me not to be in a hurry and i've taken your advice 
i feel i am decidedly mellower than i was but i'm not yet ripe shall you write under your own name no if you write under your own name you cannot help being handicapped to some extent by your circumstances and surroundings you know what your friends will expect of you and you feel bound in some measure to fulfil their expectations but if you write under a nom de plume you are quite free i see what you mean and i think i agree with you said isabel for instance i should say lots of things that my father would not agree with my opinions on most matters being different from his though my admiration and respect for his character are greater than they ever were he has found truth and righteousness and i hope to find them some day but i shall travel by different roads and use different methods from those by which he has been led mind you i do not say or even think that mine are better than his but they are different owing to the difference in our characters and our generations i perfectly understand said isabel sympathetically then do you see if i wrote as his son he would have to bear in a measure the onus of my work and that would not be fair to him you are quite right but do not wait too long before you begin your book do not wait till you are blasé and cynical and have lost all your illusions do you like people to keep their illusions paul asked yes oh yes i always pray that i may never outlive my illusions or my front teeth though all else may fail me paul laughed then he said more seriously it seems to me that the more you see of the world and men and things and the better you understand them the less cynical you ought to be i believe that tout comprendre et tout pardonner i am so glad to hear you say that it is what i have always thought it disgusts me continued paul that when people tell you to look at anything as a man of the world they mean you are to take the most disagreeable view possible i know when you begin life you think that everything is rose colour this is crude you find that some things are not rose colour and then you think that everything is blue mouldy this is also crude but when you have really seen life and the world you know that some things are rose colour and some are blue mouldy and that the majority are neither one nor the other to me the blue mouldy stage is only one degree less raw and crude than the rose colour one and much more objectionable how well you put things exclaimed isabel you seem to think all the thoughts which i have thought but have struggled in vain to express but you are able also to express them and one grand thing about you is that you always say all that you think paul smiled not quite all do you mean that there are bluebeard's chambers in your heart that even i have not looked into yes but i want to look in persisted isabel but you can't yet can i ever i don't know it depends on whether you are willing to wait or not but as you said to me you mustn't be in a hurry replied paul i know most of your heart and mind but this i suppose is an additional exhibition like the chamber of horrors at madame tussaud's and one has to pay sixpence extra to see it only it isn't a chamber of horrors and sixpence isn't enough but i've got more than sixpence i know you have miss carnaby but i haven't and it is i who have to pay this entrance fee that is why i am saving up my money and editing magazines and writing stupid stories do you think i should be interested if i ever did see it asked isabel i don't know but what do you think you might or you might not replied paul anyhow you might tell me what it is like do tell me what it is like dear mr seaton paul thought for a moment it is rather like an ordinary looking-glass he said in fact you couldn't tell the difference isabel laughed how silly you are in some things but not in this there's the gong exclaimed isabel we are late at lunch that day lord wrexham took upon himself to expound to paul a new system of surface drainage whereof he thought most highly and so paul did not again get word with isabel 
till they too started for a walk across the park in the afternoon lord wrexham was terribly agrarian to-day wasn't he said isabel he is awfully boring when he begins to explain things but he is a nice man answered paul and he would be really interesting to listen to if a fellow wasn't wanting to talk to you all the time instead oh i find him dreadfully tiresome when he becomes agricultural and explanatory you really ought not to abuse him for he admires you most tremendously isabel shrugged her shoulders i know he does men of that age always do i shouldn't be surprised if you admired me when you are as old as lord wrexham i shouldn't either said paul i think i should rather like it if you did should you then i'll try i always try to do what you want you know however difficult it may be isabel laughed i am fond of admiration she said so i should have supposed but i'm not one of those tiresome exacting women who are always longing to be first with everybody i can't stand the sort of women who suffer from what they call heart hunger can you they are pretty bad agreed paul but i'm not like that am i no you like people to admire you and you take a good deal of trouble to ensure this result but you are not in the least exigeante i don't think you'd expect to be first with a person unless that person was first with you and then of course you'd have a right to expect it that is quite true how well you understand me i don't want men to go in jeopardy of their lives by fetching water for me from the wells of bethlehem but i do want them to be ready and willing to take me down to supper at balls and to bring me refreshments at evening parties paul smiled you appear to be a wonderfully reasonable woman i'm so glad you think that i always consider my sweet reasonableness one of my strong points but it is only because you don't really care continued paul the minute you begin to care you'll be as unreasonable as the rest of them isabel frowned how horrid you are am i i'm sorry for that but it grieves my righteous soul to see you hugging your negligences and ignorances and mistaking them for virtues i wish you were not so nasty sighed isabel when you are as nasty as this it makes a walk with you a toil instead of a pleasure well don't make it a danger instead of a toil which you will do if you walk on that damp grass i shall walk on that damp grass as long as you are disagreeable i wish you wouldn't and paul's face grew quite anxious you'll be certain to catch cold if you do and i do so hate you to have a cold i can see your feet are quite wet already and then paul smiled to himself remembering how edgar ford had once said a man must be at a woman's feet before he knows when they are getting wet and is ready to lay his cloak across the puddles to keep them dry i shall walk in the damp till you leave off being disagreeable persisted isabel well what is it that you want me to say i want you to say that you think i am a most reasonable woman not that i only appear to be i can't say that for it wouldn't be true but i don't mind saying that i think a reasonable woman the most tiresome and detestable being under heaven and then isabel came off the grass i wish you thought better of me she said with a sigh paul laughed i'm very glad i don't it is quite enough for me as it is thank you i mean i wish you said pretty things to me like other men do but i am nothing if not original it seems very unfortunate murmured isabel that you are the only man that i want to say pretty things to me and that therefore you won't say them pardon me miss carnaby you are confusing cause and effect i do not refrain from saying pretty things because you want me to say them but you want me to say them because i refrain why are you so fond of making me cross asked isabel with a pout because it is the most amusing form of sport i know i used to think that rowing and fishing ran it close but now i have decided that making you cross is the most fascinating pastime in the world bar one you've never tried the other i know i've not probably that is why i still retain such a high opinion of it i'm not sure that it would amuse you if you did try it 
neither am i replied paul but i am not going to try it till i am quite sure that it would not amuse you then don't you like to see me enjoying myself certainly within reasonable limits i like to see children enjoying themselves but there are some things that i should refuse to give them as playthings but you would give those things to the children when they were old enough to appreciate them said isabel coaxingly perhaps how soon do you think i shall be old enough to appreciate things paul smiled perhaps when you have grown tired of living on refreshments at evening parties and want some water from the well of bethlehem for a change then do you despise me for liking refreshments at evening parties asked isabel not in the least but i think it is rather a youthful taste like currant wine or raspberry vinegar there will come a time when it won't satisfy you and then you will cry out for living water from the well at bethlehem which by the way was your metaphor not mine but it expresses what i mean and what will happen then ah that i can't say it will depend upon whether any one out of the legions who have lackeyed you and taken you down to countless ball suppers is ready to go in jeopardy of his life for you and that only time can show isabel thought for a moment there is rather a good lesson for all women in our well metaphor isn't there yes replied paul women as a rule make such dreadful mistakes you see nothing but love will really satisfy a woman in the long run and unattractive women as a rule acknowledge this but attractive women get such a lot of admiration that they think at first that admiration will satisfy them i know admiration is like porridge awfully stodging but you get hungry again almost as soon as you've eaten it exactly therefore continued paul an attractive woman is more likely to make this mistake than an unattractive one yet when the time comes that her heart cries out for reality she will need it quite as much as her less admired sister though probably by that time she will have thrown it away and not be able to find it again the unattractive woman on the other hand treasures up every bit of love she receives and makes the most of it i see it is a serious thing to be an attractive woman after all said isabel thoughtfully then she looked up at paul and smiled but it would be worse to be an unattractive one wouldn't it oh you don't think i ever shall be do you mr seaton not even when i'm old and grey please say you don't and paul said it and said it several times and what is more he meant what he said End of chapter eight chapter nine of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter nine indecision do i love you can i prove you more than all the world to me thus i ponder and i wonder what my true reply must be one afternoon early in the season following paul's visit to elton manor he and isabel were seated under a tree in kensington gardens it was one of those days when spring pretends that it is summer and the parks pretend that they are the country and all the world pretends that it is young again nevertheless paul's face was very serious miss carnaby he said i want to speak to you isabel shrugged her shoulders i'm sorry for that and you look such a potent grave and reverend signor that i feel certain you are going to say something disagreeable now do think twice before you speak i have thought twice and twice a million times over twice a million times over i wonder how much that is i cannot do the sum myself i am such a poor adder or ought i to say a poor addist a poor adder sounds so poisonous and serpenty doesn't it but paul would not laugh won't you listen to me he asked 
i suppose i have no alternatives as you have paid the penny for my chair and i am partaking of your hospitality for the time being but it really is a pity to use up such a lovely afternoon in speaking seriously serious speaking like bagatelle ought to be reserved as an amusement for wet days i really want to speak to you persisted paul i am not joking my dear sir i never for a moment imagined you were your expression just now would grace a mute at a funeral and yet you take the trouble to inform me that you are not joking you might as well have taken the trouble to inform me that you were not swimming or painting or driving a cab it really isn't kind of you to go on like this miss carnaby and it really isn't kind of you to spoil such a lovely afternoon by speaking seriously paul did not answer so isabel rattled on now you are sulking and if there is one thing i hate more than another it is a sulky temper i'd rather have a squint than a sulky temper any day besides dark men should never look sulky it isn't becoming to them it gives a lurid thundery sort of expression to their faces paul still remained silent but isabel did not dare to do so for a moment isn't it a jolly afternoon she continued and these gardens look perfectly lovely but i hope it isn't going to be too hot for the wallingford's ball next week i can't bear a hot ballroom your face gets so red and your fringe goes out of curl and altogether you look like one of turner's sunsets in the national gallery at least i do and i can't bear to feel i'm looking like a sunset why don't you smile when a lady talks to you it is positively refrigerating to talk to a man with an expression like yours why don't you smile like a little gentleman as the nursemaids around us would say because i am not amused that is very rude of you and you are generally such a prettily behaved person you don't seem to be listening to me either i'm not said paul i'm thinking about something else fie fie master seaton whatever will your mamma say when you get home cried isabel shaking her finger at him when you have quite finished i should like to have my innings said paul grimly but i don't in the least wish to hurry you you are the most unappreciative man i ever talked to look here miss carnaby it isn't fair to treat a fellow like this will you listen to me or will you not because if you won't i'm going away isabel looked to see if he were in earnest when paul was in earnest she knew by experience other people had to be in earnest too all right she sighed say your say paul's face grew very white i never made love to a woman before and i never shall again so i am a poor hand at the business but you know how i love you and i want to know if you will be my wife oh mr seaton i can't tell you what you are to me continued paul but you know as well as i do that i've cared for nothing in the world but you ever since that evening at esdale you have seen how i have hungered for a kind word from you and how i have starved when it pleased your whim to withhold it from me you have seen all this and it has amused you but i think it has done something more than amuse you or else i shouldn't be speaking like this to you to-day am i right isabel yes she whispered i didn't mean to speak yet but i simply cannot go on like this any longer the thought of you comes between me and everything else till i cannot carry on my work or do my duty for thinking of you sometimes i think you really care a bit and then i am lifted up to heaven and sometimes i think you have merely been playing with me all the time and then i am plunged in the depths of despair i must know one way or the other this suspense is killing me poor boy said isabel gently no i don't want your pity or your friendship i want your love or nothing at all if i cannot have that i must do my best to put you out of my life altogether i will not go on like this still our friendship is very nice said isabel weakly it isn't enough for me it unsettles me and takes away my peace of mind without giving me happiness in return i feel that i could do anything with you to help me i feel i could do something without you altogether 
but i know i can do nothing as long as i am tortured by seeing daily my heart's desire and not knowing if it can ever be mine or not i wonder my friendship doesn't please you more said isabel with some pique other men have found it both satisfying and stimulating paul smiled scornfully not the men who have loved you as i love you he said other men love me as much as you do persisted isabel then let them love you and let me go replied paul roughly i may be poor and obscure and a nobody in your world but i am a man all the same and i'll let no fine lady make a plaything of me you are very unkind i am very unhappy isabel pouted it is your own fault if you are i'm sure i am nice enough to you to please the most exacting man but i don't thank you for mere niceness can't you understand you are nice to all the men that admire you but there are some things a fellow can't and won't share i am asking for bread and therefore when diamonds and rubies fall from my lips you call them stones concluded isabel flippantly paul's face grew stern don't laugh at me he said it is doing both yourself and me an injustice if you cannot love me tell me so and let me go out of the sight of your face and live my own life as best i can and if you can love me tell me so and make me the happiest man this side of paradise but for pity's sake don't play with me isabel's eyes filled with tears please forgive me she said it was horrid of me but i did not mean it i know you didn't replied paul and his voice shook oh my darling do you think i don't realize all that i am asking of you do you think i don't know the all that you will have to give up if you marry a poor man like me but i want you dear and i cannot do without you you've always been very good to me said isabel tell me i cannot bear the suspense any longer is there any chance for me isabel looked paul full in the face i will tell you the truth she said i owe you that at any rate the best side of me does love you and wants always to be with you and knows that i can never be a really good woman apart from you but there is another side of me which cares for rank and wealth and power and fights against your influence all the time paul's eyes were very pitiful i understand he said the question is continued isabel which of my two selves is the stronger the one that loves you or the one that doesn't and you must leave me to fight it out by myself yes answered paul that is but fair and just i will wait another week patiently but after that i must know my fate once and for all and you must always remember added isabel that the self that is on your side is my best self and that if i decide against you i shall be choosing evil rather than good aunt caroline said isabel to lady farley the next day paul seaton has asked me to be his wife i knew he would replied her aunt men with chins like his never make love without meaning it i am to give him his answer in a week and i want you to advise me my dear child i dare not give advice on so important a matter you are twenty-seven therefore old enough to know your own mind and to please yourself i mean to please myself aunt caroline but i want you to help me to find out what will please me i will do all i can in that line with pleasure but the decision must rest with you alone tell me your pros and cons isabel thought for a moment the pros are that he is a good man and a gentleman and i love him and he has the nicest eyes in the whole world her aunt smiled and the cons the cons are that he has neither money nor position and would be considered a poor match in the world in which i live do you think you would be happy with him asked lady farley radiantly so he is so clever that i should let him make up my mind upon every subject 
i think it must be lovely to have a husband to make up one's mind for one some women prefer making up the husband's mind for him it is merely a matter of taste my dear isabel the only thing to be avoided is two separate minds in a house each making itself up i know laughed isabel a sort of william and mary business exactly what should you do if you were in my place aunt caroline personally it would not amuse me to marry mr seaton on the contrary it would bore me considerably he is so didactic and so overpoweringly in earnest but that is no reason why it should not amuse you it wouldn't amuse me to marry uncle benjamin you see and yet it amuses you not always my dear i have known it have quite an opposite effect but then your uncle is a g c b and a rich man and those things amuse me a good deal but love ought to count for something said isabel timidly of course it ought i am allowing for that but it counts a good deal more with some women than it does with others and a woman should take this into consideration some women positively enjoy a little mild starvation flavoured with romance i should i think then take it my dear said lady farley positive starvation is always i believe indigestible but the moderate starvation which your own comfortable little income would allow of might prove quite a treat to people who like picnics by moderate starvation i suppose you mean doing one's own hair and buttoning one's own boots yes and everything else en suite this again is a matter of taste and each must please herself but what i cannot stand is a woman who deliberately chooses love in a cottage and then throws the cottage in her husband's teeth and omits the love make your choice i say but when you have made it stick to it i have no patience with girls who will marry poor men and then quarrel with them for being poor agreed isabel neither have i if i married paul i should never be nasty to him afterwards because he wasn't rich i should hope you would not said lady farley i should be ashamed of having brought you up if you were but that is all the more reason for not being in a hurry i know it is i also think my dear isabel that among the cons you should reckon up the fact that lord wrexham is very much in love with you and that you might be a peeress if you were so minded yes you should also make a note that society will invite lady wrexham to dinner but mrs paul seaton only to the reception afterwards isabel winced i know that also then my dear child there is no more to be said this is the evidence it is for you to consider the verdict and isabel did consider it to the exclusion of every other subject and grew pale and wan with the conflict betwixt her contending inclinations but true to her order she fulfilled all her social engagements and talked and laughed as courageously as ever the marchioness of wallingford's ball was one of the events of the season and it fell on the eve of the day when isabel was to give paul his final answer yet the girl was as undecided as ever when she donned her war paint during the evening she sat out a dance with lord bobby he and isabel had become firm and fast friends since he had confided to her his attachment to her cousin violet and she had sympathized with him you don't look very flourishing said lord bobby kindly as they sat together under the shelter of a huge palm has any one been bullying you life in general has been bullying me replied isabel sadly how vile of it i never thought so badly of life before it certainly won't be worth living if it begins to be rude to you i shall have to give it the cut direct by committing suicide if it insults you again 
oh bobby do help me cried isabel with a sudden impulse laying a beseeching little hand on his arm you are so young and foolish and everybody else is so old and wise i'm old and wise too and i'm sick of it poor little girl what is wrong paul seat wants me to marry him and i want it too but i'm not sure if i've the courage to make such a bad match i know i'm a wretch to feel like that but that is how i feel bobby's pleasant face grew grave i know he said the good part of me loves him but the worldly part of me loves money and position and pleasure and i don't know which is in the majority if you were only a government instead of a woman you'd find out by means of a dissolution remarked his lordship then try the same method how do you mean asked isabel looking puzzled in the event of your dissolution what should you do if i were dying do you mean oh then of course i should care only for paul and money and all that would matter nothing to me then why not apply the dissolution test to a woman as well as to a government suggested lord robert there is a good deal in what you say i feel sure that if i sent paul away my heart would cry out for him sooner or later then why not let it cry now when there is a chance of an r s v p because i am afraid to give up all the rank and pleasure and luxury that have made life so pleasant to me it is selfish of me i know but i can't help it you seem in a regular fix said lord bobby with much sympathy every one i consult is so old and wise and knows so well the value of outside things does everybody grow worldly as they grow older i wonder everybody except mothers answered bobby simply they never get old or wise or anything horrid but i haven't got a mother said isabel with a little catch in her voice poor little girl said bobby and there were tears in his honest blue eyes you see continued isabel if i marry paul the frivolous side of me may come to the front when it is too late and i may spoil his life by becoming a dissatisfied and grumbling wife bobby nodded while on the other hand if i let him go i shall become hard and shallow and worldly and the best part of my nature will die of starvation oh bobby what am i to do bobby thought profoundly for several seconds then he said seaton is a good fellow there is no doubt of that but the question just now is not what is he in himself but how much does he count for in your estimate of life that is just what i want to find out sighed isabel look here continued bobby when he comes into a room does it seem to you as if the place was full of pink light and the band was playing god save the queen outside yes yes it feels just like that assented isabel eagerly then if you've got to that stage you mustn't let him go there's only one course open to you when you feel like that you can't of course be sure that you'll be happy with that particular person but you may be certain that you'll be utterly miserable without him there is my next partner searching for me said isabel rising from her seat thank you bobby how you have helped me a few days after lady wallingford's ball lady esdale called upon her sister-in-law my dear caroline she began is it true that isabel has engaged herself to that young seaton perfectly true replied lady farley with a sigh how funny of her he isn't at all well off but isabel has got her own money so that won't matter as much as it might if she hadn't anything though i can't help feeling it is a poor match for a girl who has been run after as much as isabel isabel is old enough to please herself of course she is caroline i'd been married for ages and ages when i was as old as isabel 
but please don't think i'm saying anything against mr seaton because i'm not he is a dear man and no one knows how adorable he was once when dick was ill i was always confusing the gargle with the medicine and wanting to give the dear boy the wrong one by mistake but mr seaton never once mistook them for each other wasn't it awfully clever of him he is generally considered to be a clever man remarked lady farley dryly i know he is and so good and religious too of course it is awfully nice for a man to be clever and religious and all that but it seems a funny reason for marrying him don't you think lady farley smiled satirically funnier than if he were rich or had a title she said but isabel always was rather original caroline i wonder if she will be happy with mr seaton that is the idea i believe of course one cannot tell yet how it will work out and you will miss her i dare say continued lady Esdale, not noticing that her sister-in-law winced at this remark it will quite be like losing a daughter i should mind dreadfully if violet were to get married and yet i should mind more if she didn't i think it really is difficult to know always what one does want and still more difficult to get it added lady farley i never know which one hates the most the men who want to marry your daughter or the men who don't they both seem tiresome somehow don't they caroline my dear constance all men are more or less tiresome i know replied lady Estelle feelingly and so silly about their dinners richard says our new cook is a woman of one gravy and he wants me to speak about it to the housekeeper but if ever i do speak about things it always ends in unpleasantness and i'd far rather make richard angry than one of the servants so i shan't interfere lady farley smiled it takes all my courage continued lady Estelle, to scold my own maid about things that really matter such as the way she does my hair and puts my clothes on and i really have none to spare for dinners and things like that but i do wonder if isabel will be happy i should think a small house would feel poky even with a really nice man like mr seaton shouldn't you stuffy to a degree i should imagine especially if one knew that one might be reigning as lady wrexham at vernacre instead and lady farley sighed again for she had been very proud of isabel End of chapter nine chapter ten of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter ten eden as a place of residence eden was closed when adam and eve left home and no one can live there it is supposed for many a year to come but now and again in the summer days the gardens are open thrown that the public may walk down the grassy ways and nobody walks alone paul and isabel were sitting in kensington gardens under the very tree where he asked her if she would be his wife they now considered this tree their own peculiar property and felt inclined to prosecute as trespassers any impertinent persons who dared so much as to walk beneath its shadow and here was their usual trysting place in those long and happy afternoons when the year and their engagement were alike young isn't it dreadful to think how we lived all those years without even having seen each other remarked paul isabel sighed it was a shocking waste of time and it kept me so ignorant and backward added paul i used to think that fine ladies were animated fashion plates what do you think they are now i don't think i know that they are ideal beings with the airs of paradise and the graces of paris i used to think that men were stupid creatures who only cared about dinners and debentures and things of that sort said isabel what do you think them now 
i know they are intelligent animals with abominable tempers paul laughed you are very rude i know i am that is because i care for you i am always rude to the people i really care for that is unwise of you remarked paul though a not uncommon form of unwisdom i have often noticed that the people who are ready to die for you never think it necessary to pass the salt they seem to imagine that the greater includes the less which it doesn't the wise people added isabel are aware that if they only pay you compliments and open your umbrella for you they will have all the credit of dying for you with none of the expense they are clever enough to know that in questions of manners the less includes the greater or at any rate infers it then why are you rude to me my dear isabel you don't seem to live up to your principles i don't a girl once told me that i should make a bad wife a good friend and a simply perfect acquaintance and i believe she was right paul smiled that is hardly a comforting prospect for me but i mean to risk it nevertheless you see continued isabel who always enjoyed vivisecting herself i am awfully nice to people until i begin to care for them then i become horrid it is unfortunate i admit but nevertheless it is true as i remarked before i cannot commend your wisdom said paul i should pursue a precisely opposite course myself you do replied isabel with generosity unlike me you live up to your principles when first i met you i thought you rather stiff and difficult to get on with talking to you was like walking up hill or rowing up stream but now you grow more delightful every day and more easy to talk to paul looked pleased i certainly take more trouble to be nice to you than to anybody else and you succeed beyond your wildest expectations but i am quite different as long as i really didn't care for you i was able to be perfectly charming i know i was you both were and are said paul isabel shook her head i know as well as ever the things i ought to say to you to please you and a year ago i should have said them but now my own feelings get in the way and i want to say the things that please me and so i cease to be charming but my dear girl the things that please you please me oh no they don't you deceive yourself if you think they do though less clever than i was before i fell in love i am still a clever woman and i know that if i said to you all i want to say i should bore you to death try me that's all was paul's terse rejoinder for instance if i followed my own impulses i should ask you every hour if you loved me as much as you did the hour before that would be a foolish question you know i do then continued isabel i should ask you if you liked me as well as other people and things all of which i should mention separately till the list was as long and exhaustive as the benedicite that also would be a foolish question you know i love you more than everything and everybody else put together you see i was right cried isabel triumphantly my normal conversation if i gave the rein to it would bore you no it wouldn't you couldn't bore me if you tried but i own i should consider it somewhat unnecessary i don't believe a man ever could really understand a woman said isabel rather sadly perhaps not any more than a woman could really understand a man but i don't see that it matters as long as they love one another isabel was silent what i don't understand in women is their passion for trying dangerous experiments continued paul now i am ready to suffer any amount of pain if you could gain any benefit thereby but i am not ready i confess to suffer any amount of pain for you just to see how i look when i am suffering it isabel tried not to smile but failed do you know when i am trying experiments on you she asked perfectly i am not such a fool as you think and i strongly object to the process besides it does as little credit to your eye as to your heart because i really don't look at all nice when i am cross or unhappy now do i no my dear paul i am bound to own that affliction is most unbecoming to you then why subject me to it isabel made another futile attempt not to smile look here said her lover if you will only say straight out to me i am going to talk to mr jones or mr smith just to make you jealous 
i shall know what you are driving at and i will be a very othello as long as it pleases you in fact you needn't bring jones or smith into the concern at all just say paul i want you to be jealous for half an hour and i will entertain the green-eyed monster to any extent how absurd you are but continued paul when you suddenly without any apparent reason develop an abnormal craving for the society of jones or smith coupled with an equally inexplicable aversion to the sight of me i cannot for the life of me make out what i have done to offend you and my days are made wretched and my nights hideous by dreams of suicide and agonies of remorse isabel laughed if you are clever enough to see through my little game why does it make you so miserable she asked that is where i am such an ass although by this time i have learnt the reason of your intermittent attachments to jones or smith nothing but the customs of good society grafted on to an early religious training keeps me from punching of heads and shedding of blood every time i see you smile on the brutes you dear man you really are very nice so are you when you don't think that a course of jealousy is necessary to my moral training added paul it isn't good for you to have everything your own way said isabel reprovingly if you want to see how i look when i am being hurt tell me so and i will go and have a tooth out said paul pleasantly i should much prefer that to seeing you talk to the sort of idiots you flirt with sometimes you are a very obliging young man i am true this plan can only be carried out thirty-two times for obvious reasons but i dare say we shall think of something else for the thirty-third if only you will be patient does it really hurt much when i am nasty to you inquired isabel i should think so can't you see that it does you look rather horrid paul i must say on those occasions and i feel horrid too yet i am a reasonable man and i can see that you had a right to try this dodge two or three times just to prove to yourself that i really cared but what beats me is why you keep on doing it when you are as certain that i love you as you are that i am sitting here it is like vaccinating a baby every week just to torture the creature oh paul i don't do it every week only once in three weeks at most paul smiled couldn't you make the experiments like angels visits few and far between say once in six weeks now you forgive me each time however often i do it i've noticed that oh i should forgive you till seventy times seven but that doesn't make it any the pleasanter for me poor old boy whispered isabel tenderly by the way said paul i want you to come with me to see my people you have not seen them yet and i want to show them what a prize i have been lucky enough to win will you come to chaford with me next week yes if you want me to i will do anything you want paul always then we will go next tuesday i wonder if your people will like me mused isabel of course they will how could they being sane do otherwise suppose they don't like me persisted isabel then i shall quarrel with them but they will i am sure of it how sure you always are of everything paul am i yes you are so strong you always do what you mean to do and other people always do what you wish paul shook his head i have meant to do two things in my life and i have only done one of them fifty per cent is not such an enormous success after all what were the two things asked isabel i meant to take a first at oxford and i meant to make you love me but it wasn't your own fault that you couldn't take a first at least it would have been your fault if you had done so instead of helping your people it was splendid of you to give up your ambition for them thank you dear said paul still the fact remains that i did not do what i meant to do which shows that there is a stronger power than one's own will after all i used to think that success or failure lay in the hollow of one's hand and now i am beginning to see that the best of us can do nothing but rough hew but when i was young i made up my mind to shape my own ends for myself and now as regards the two things that i wanted most divinity shaped the one and it is left to you to shape the other so i am not such a very independent fellow after all i hope i shall shape my part all right said isabel softly paul looked grave it will go hard with me if you don't isabel 
there was great excitement at chaford over the news of paul's engagement mrs martin had always hated paul for fear he should wish to marry alice but she hated him still more for not having wished it and she hated isabel most of all for having come between alice and the thing which was considered most undesirable for her i trust that this engagement will turn out for paul's real welfare she said to paul's mother one day but i have my doubts as miss carnaby is evidently a thoroughly worldly person and so will probably be very extravagant paul is so devoted to miss carnaby that i feel no doubt about her making him happy replied paul's mother cheerfully and i am sure she must be really nice and good or else paul would not be so fond of her mrs martin shook her head beauty and rank are minor matters and have i fear proved more attractive to paul than more solid charms miss carnaby is not beautiful however suggested mrs seaton though paul says her aunt lady farley is mrs martin pricked up her ears at the title is her aunt called lady farley did you say dear me how very interesting what farleys are they sir benjamin farley is a g c b i believe and had an indian governorship for a time i know the name i have often seen it in the papers but i had no idea that sir benjamin was a prospective relative of dear paul's i hope mrs seaton that should lady farley ever visit you you will do your old friend the honour of asking me to meet her i do not expect lady farley ever will visit me said the minister's wife rather stiffly still if she did dear friend it would be such a delight to me to meet her and such an advantage too for talking with those interesting and distinguished public characters is an education in itself i consider although mrs seaton fully recognized the necessity for education on mrs martin's part she did not feel herself called upon to supply the need so she merely said paul and miss carnaby are coming to stay with us next week indeed how very delightful i hope that you will bring the dear young lady frequently to see us while she is with you she will doubtless feel much more at home in a house like the cedars than in a small cottage such as this paul's wife will have to make herself at home among paul's people said mrs seaton quietly but think of the discomfort persisted mrs martin with her usual tact and refinement of feeling to a person accustomed to a large establishment don't you think it would be better if miss carnaby stayed at the cedars altogether mr martin and i should be very pleased to entertain her and she would be a nice friend for alice and visions of alice's entry into society by the door of isabel floated through mrs martin's mind it is very kind of you but i am sure paul would prefer miss carnaby to stay with us you see if she is a lady she will think no worse of us for having a small house and living quietly and if she is not paul had better find it out before it is too late but mrs martin still looked doubtful it will be a great change from what she is accustomed to and i cannot help feeling that the dear young lady would be more at home with us the minister's wife could hardly restrain a smile as she recalled a sentence in her son's last letter which said whatever you do keep those awful martins out of the way their blatant vulgarity would make isabel positively ill and i don't want her to be exposed to it but she wisely kept the humour of the situation to herself and held her peace i suppose you will dine late while miss carnaby is with you persisted mrs martin an early dinner is considered extremely vulgar by well-bred people i can assure you mrs seaton looked surprised certainly not why should we i cannot see anything vulgar in the time of one's dinner it is merely a matter of household convenience but i think it would be extremely vulgar to alter our habits so as to make our visitor imagine that we were in any way different from what we are nothing is really vulgar save pretence and that is always vulgar in whatever rank of society it is found ah dear mrs seaton you are too unworldly believe me it is the small things that you despise such as late dinners and plenty of servants and proper evening dresses that make the difference between gentle people and others 
do you think so i had an idea that the difference lay in quite another direction then you were mistaken replied mrs martin i am extremely sensitive to such things myself and i assure you i should not feel that i was a lady if i dined before seven o'clock and did not dress for dinner it is in these trifles that good breeding is really shown mr martin laughs at me but i tell him i could not digest my dinner if i did not wear a low dress and a flower in my hair even if it were only a chrysanthemum for the first time in her life mrs seaton felt that her sense of humour ran on the same lines as mr martin's but she did not point out this similarity to his wife she merely preserved the chrysanthemum in her memory to regale paul and joanna with at some future time but there was no one in chaford more deeply interested in paul's love affair than martha well to be sure miss joanna she said one day it seems only yesterday that i whipped master paul for flying into a passion and kicking mrs martin's cook because she passed the remark that you were the ugliest little girl she'd ever set eyes on and now he is old enough to be taking to himself a wife time does fly and no mistake joanna sighed she was a good woman and unselfish but it is a bitter thing to look into happiness through another man's eyes isabel carnaby is a lucky girl she remarked for i am sure paul is a man who will make any woman happy martha shook her head don't be too sure of anything about a man miss not even if it is our paul they are queer creatures even the best of them you are always hard on men martha so i am miss they are such wild feckless folks first in a tantrum about one thing and then about another till there is no pleasing them and they are no use and far less ornament as far as i can see you don't understand how to manage them i am afraid laughed joanna not i my dear the lord who made them may understand them but i don't for if i'd had the making of them they'd have been after a different pattern i can tell you but you must not say all this to miss carnaby warned the wise joanna of course not miss i know well enough what to say to folks that are courting now there was my niece eunice tozer she got engaged to a young man in her father's shop and a sore disappointment it was to them all herself included that she hadn't done better i hope you didn't say so to her martha not i my dear she came complaining to me that it was but a poor settling for her but i soon cheered her up eunice says i with such a plain face as yours it is a wonder you've got a husband at all let alone the sort and you ought to be thankful instead of finding fault that was the way to look at the matter to my thinking and i soon made eunice see it in the same light was eunice happy when she was married joanna asked as happy as any woman could be with a man tied to her for the rest of her days but as you know i don't hold with the men miss they are troublesome creatures especially all of them they are indeed exclaimed joanna with amusement you see miss my mother always said that the troubles which came direct from the lord she could bear without murmuring but the troubles which came from father's stupidity were a different thing and she hadn't common patience with them many a time as she passed the remark that if a woman has got a husband she spends all her life in bearing for him the consequences of the things she particularly told him not to do joanna nodded that must really be very irritating it would try me more than anything and me too miss there is nothing like a man for trying the temper mark my word it is because there is no marrying or giving in marriage in heaven that the temper of an angel is the temper of an angel if the angels had got husbands there'd be a different tale about their tempers i'll be bound End of chapter ten